Hi, I'm Michael P. Coleman, Content Director for Brother Be Well. I want to welcome you to this webinar. It's the first of a two-part series where we're going to walk through some of Brother Be Well's work over the summer to develop policies for schools, mainly regional schools, with regard to behavioral health and substance use prevention. We added this to our Youth Substance Youth Prevention Summer Academy. Just this past summer, for the second time, we brought together a really dynamic cohort of young people to take a look at substance use prevention strategies with a master addictions counselor and with one of our clinical advisors, take a look at a lot of mental health um, potential roadblocks, issues, and problems that young people are, are engaged in or will be engaged in to try to help them as they chart the next chapters in their life. Relatively late in that process, we decided to combine some of the school policy work that we had just begun to do here at Brother People, working with again, school districts to strengthen in some cases, or in some cases develop from the ground up, some of the policies and procedures they have in place with regard to behavioral health and substance use prevention. Now, you might be watching this and wonder why would uh, an academic institution need to be engaged in school policy work and policy work with regard to behavioral health and substance use prevention? I could answer that and I do a decent job of that. But what we do here at Brother Be Well is we bring in the best people to answer questions like that. And so the best person to answer that question is the mental health clinician who worked directly with us on the Youth Substance Use Prevention Project. His name is Christian Jacobs. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist, and he's a, a good friend of mine and of ours here at Brother Be Well. What's up, Christian? How you doing? Hey, what's up, Michael? How's it going? It's fat. I'm fantastic, man. Always good to see you. You know that. You doing all right? Oh, I'm doing well, man. I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me as well. No, I appreciate it. We all appreciate it. You know, before we take a look at those actual findings, I thought, why don't I pose the question to you? And it's a bit of a devil's advocate. I think I know what the answer is. But why don't you address that person that's watching this right now, and they might not be making the connection between Brother Be Well, um, an organization that is involved with, with, engaged with mental health education, especially with young people, and schools and, and, and academic institutions adding those policies and procedures, types of policies and procedures to their curriculum. You're a licensed marriage and family therapist. I take it that you deal with families and young people all the time. So help us make the connection. Why should that be important that every single school is taking a look at this right now? Well, that's, that's an excellent question. And I think the important thing I just want to say before, you know, is that the, the main issue is that we understand that um, schools and faculty and staff are you know, they're at the point after pandemic, they're putting fires out. So sometimes these ideas may not come up, up to their minds in terms of the long-term strategic plans and programs, because right now they're you know trying to keep their classes in order and, you know, have, you know, uh, you sit down things that sort. So this may not be on the front of their minds, but I think it's really the, the important part is that it's going to negatively impact without these programs, the outcomes could negatively impact how they show up as, college students down the road and parents and, you know, adults in the, in the future, just, just to talk about, you know, statistically, you know, you're looking at, you know, this really the age where youth are experiencing substance use is much earlier. So now it's happening at an earlier age than it has been as ever before. I know before, you know, especially growing up, the term, remember the term gateway drug? Um, that term is almost obsolete now due to fitting them. We don't have the ability or the freedom as, as you do now, you don't have that freedom to experiment because, you know, one wrong use of a drug could, you know, end their life, you know. So that's another issue that's happening due to a new introduction of a fentanyl and experimentation goes out the window. Just looking at academics, you know, with one of young developing brains under the adults, it makes it harder to learn and memorize, and, you know, which makes teachers and faculty have to work harder at the job. So there's another connection. And, then we talk about disciplinary actions, you know, you're looking at, you know, classroom disruptions and uh, also that makes the teacher's job harder, come to development, you know, it's, um, their brains are already developing and they don't finish developing until 25 for the women. So from a mental health perspective, it really does exacerbate mental health conditions as well. And, you know, about talking about ADHD or dyslexia or things of that sort. So when you combine substance use with, you know, medication for those such as Adderall, we have some challenges. So those are just a few <laughs> things I could think of um, that uh, why why the importance of the having substance use programs in elementary K through twelve and higher ed that matter is important. You always you always catch me with something new that I hadn't thought about, Christian. 
we don't have the luxury anymore of talking about gateway drugs. And we all grew up talking about those and hearing about them. And that's a really great perspective that today's youth are dealing with challenges that we just didn't have to deal with. Um, something you said reminded me of the work that, that we did, and we'll talk about it a little bit later when three of that cohort I talked about comes to join us. Uh, Roland Williams is a master addictions counselor. He works with those guys. You remember, he was with us an hour a week for 10, 10 weeks over the summer. And, you know, not just the youth were impacted by that. A lot of what Roland had to say about fentanyl and other things and the impact on young people stuck with me all these weeks later. I still think about it. So we're going to talk about a little bit of that later. Really appreciate your time, Christian. I want you to hang out because as soon as the youth come to join us, I want you to come back if you don't mind and we'll mix it up a little bit. I'll, I'll be here. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Next up, well, let's get to that work that we did. We talked about those policy recommendations and the person that's going to walk us through those are is one of those mentors that I talked about earlier. His name is Conrad Crump. The young people came to know him as Coach Crump. And when you get to hear him, you'll get a feeling of his vibe and why that happened to be. What's up, Conrad? Hey, what's happening, Michael? A uh, pleasure to be here, and thanks for that. Yes, uh, my name's Conrad Crump, affectionately known as Coach Crump. And uh, as Michael mentioned, over the past summer at Brother Be Well, our Youth Substance Use Prevention Summer Academy included a leadership and policy advocacy analysis, where a lot of our youth participants analyze mental health and substance use prevention resources of several school districts in the greater Sacramento area. Uh, we held lengthy discussions on these districts and provided feedback and recommendations for their improvement. And we discussed district policies. We had a community discussion and also created um, different ideas and recommendations and thoughtful responses as it related to some of the policies that we found uh, within those districts. So today, what I'd like to do is give a brief overview of those seven districts, uh, or at least for the first half, seven of those districts for today, and what our young men identified as it relates to their offerings of substance use prevention and mental health resources. Uh, during our analysis of these districts, um, you know, we, we came to find there were some common themes. Uh, we also found that there were some stark disparities as well. Um, it became very clear to our young men that not all school districts were created equal. Uh, with that being said, there were three overarching discussion questions that really guided our conversation and discussion. And a lot of our young brothers were asked, and as it relates to the information that was provided from each district. And the first question was, number one, based on the policies and offerings of this district, would you like to see something similar implemented at your school? Why or why not? The second question asked, what are some of the strengths and weaknesses found in the policies and offerings of the district? And lastly, what recommendations they might have with regard to the policies and offerings of the school district? So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, our very first school district that we identified was the Elk Grove Unified School District. In the Elk Grove Unified School District, we found that there was a very strong uh, tobacco prevention program and a very robust counseling and mental health resources offerings that the district provided. Uh, many of our youth participants agreed that seeing something similar implemented at their schools would truly be beneficial. And they stated that they themselves knew classmates who struggled with substance use addiction and mental health challenges and found that having supportive programs like the ones implemented at Elk Grove Unified School Districts would actually be very helpful for them and their friends. And while they expressed satisfaction with the existing substance use prevention and mental health resources, as you can see from the slide, there are many resources. Uh, the young men recommended ensuring that families and parents were made aware of these resources and were able to actually connect to them um, so that way they can really provide opportunities for their students. Our next district was the Folsom Cordova Unified School District. And with the Folsom uh, Cordova Unified School District, our Brother Be Well participants realized that there was an extensive amount of substance use prevention policies and mental health policies that were implemented. And they hoped that this school district's offerings could actually inspire other school districts in the area to follow suit. Uh, one youth actually found that, much like Elk Grove, the Folsom Cordova 
district had a heavy attention towards tobacco, but not much emphasis on other substances like drugs or alcohol. Another one of our youth recommendations was that these policies could be shared amongst other districts as many students often transfer from one district to the next. Our next district that we discussed was the Galt Union, Joint Union Elementary School District. And at the Galt School District, the only available resource on substance prevention was a Zoom meeting on the dangers of fentanyl. Similarly, uh, the Care Solace program was the only available resource on mental health. And our youth participants felt that anything more would be beneficial to the students of this district. Our, our youth also expressed their curiosity about how many students were actually caught with substances each year. Uh, another one of our participants recommended in-person community awareness presentations to better educate the students and the families on the dangers of substances and to perhaps conduct anonymous surveys to identify the number of students that are in need of support. And these surveys could also help to identify which types of substances were prevalent so that the community awareness presentations could be tailored to most to those that were the most commonly used substances. Uh, another one of our participants recommended a website where students can anonymously ask questions about substances and where they might be able to receive mental health support from trained professionals. And while we know that, you know, some districts are often stretched thin, another youth participant recommended having trained mental health professionals on site to perhaps listen to students and provide support for those who may be going through a crisis. Our next uh, district that we identified was the Center Joint Unified School District. And as you can see, there were no available resources for uh, substance use prevention for students in this district. And while there were mental health resources and counseling services that were provided, which also included a bullying prevention program, very little was offered regarding substance use prevention support. Uh, one of our youth recommendations uh, included that the district could develop an educational class that could provide information on the various substances and their detrimental effects. And another youth participant recommended conducting anonymous surveys to inquire about what substances youth had been exposed to. Lastly, a few of our Brother Be Well participants expressed their appreciation for the existence of a bullying prevention program. However, some were concerned about whether the enrolled students actually felt comfortable coming forward. In our next school district that we identified was the Alberta Joint Elementary School District. And much like the previous district, uh, there were no available resources for substance use prevention. And similarly, Care Solace was the only available resource on mental illness. Our Brother Be Well participants recommended improving communication by conducting workshops and presentations, maybe posting flyers around various campuses and communicating with parents more often. These were some of the ideas that they came up with and, um, you know, with their brilliance, just continued to provide recommendations throughout. Our sixth district was the Los Rios Community College District. And after hearing about how Los Rios provides training for their faculty and staff in the areas of mental health and, um, you know, how, you know, they really have a robust system, our youth expressed how they would also like to see this implemented in their schools, as many staff members at their schools are not trained to support students that are going through many of these mental health challenges. Um, Los Rios also provides small wellness group activities, and many of our Brother Be Well participants found that that, too, was helpful. Uh, they also recommended creating mental health spaces on the campus for students to relax and de-stress if need be. Again, many of our young men noticed that there was a heavy focus on tobacco and recommended that the district expand their focus to other substances. And going into our last district for the day the Natomas Unified School District. Surprisingly and unfortunately, this district had no available resources for substance use prevention or for mental health resources. Our youth participants really expressed their frustration with the absence and recommended the district review offerings that were provided by nearby districts. 
One youth recommended sending out an anonymous survey to better understand students' needs as it relates to health, mental health, as well as identifying what particular substances might be prevalent within their school district. Another uh, student participa participant suggested improving communication with parents and families of enrolled students in hopes of increasing pressure on the district. Other recommendations include hiring mental health counselors and trained professionals to support students. And another Brother Be Well participant recommended conducting a social media campaign relating to mental health and substance use and even suggested maintaining communication with parents through emails and phone calls. All in all, our youth participants found similar trends with their own schools, as well as needs that they found uh, within their schools and the district we discussed, and ultimately found that there was an overall increase in the need for support for our students. So as we continue the conversation, I'd like to open it up and kick it back over to Michael so we can discuss some of the other strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and some of the other results that were described by our Brother Be Well participants. Conrad, that was amazing. You had a lot of work to do, a lot of heavy lifting, because we did a lot of work in the first half of last summer, and I was worried <laughs> and quite a lot. You did a fantastic job of walking us through that. Before I bring Christian back for another question, let me. Are you reminded me when you were given that report? You reminded me of a moment in the summer when we talked about one of those districts that had nothing there with regard to to uh, substance use prevention or mental health, and I believe actually I was the first one that was kind of surprised by. And you really helped me and the rest of the group to set the stage by basically saying it's not an apples to apples comparison, that resources are very different across districts and the number of students in those districts are very different. Can you repeat a little bit of that? Because I'm sure other people might be thinking that when they, when they saw that data. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, certain districts are often stretched in on um, their lack of resources. Um, in addition to that, you know, not all districts are created equal. Some districts have many less schools and other districts have many more schools. Um, so those are, are also parts of, I would say, the equation that kind of go into what some of the districts can provide. But I would also note that one of the districts, uh, I believe it was Natomas, the last district we, we identified today, was one of those schools that really has resources and is in an area that uh, I would say is not, you know, full of Title I schools or lower income families. So I feel that they could do a better job to increase some of the resources uh, as it relates to substance use and substance use prevention and mental health. So some of those are some of the pieces and components to that conversation. You did a beautiful job. You read my mind. My next question was when you went over in the trauma, you said shockingly or surprisingly. So I was going to ask you why you're so surprised by that, but you just answered that. Appreciate it, Conrad. Hang tight. I'm going to bring Christian Jacob back to kind of reflect on that presentation a little bit. Christian, for you, it wasn't so much, I just realized it wasn't as much as of a reminder. You weren't with us in those policy sessions. Conrad and I were with the students all summer. You may have been seeing some of that for the first time. So before we bring three of the students up, I just wanted to give you a chance to reflect on what you've heard. Anything stick out for you? Yeah, that was actually that was my first time you know, hearing it too, and I think it was really good information and, and valuable just to see, you know, um, my my takeaway is really how the districts are a microcosm of our, our healthcare delivery system. You know, we have smaller uh, school districts, smaller schools with less resources, you know, bigger schools with more, you know, tax, um, tax dollars that go to the school where they can, you know, afford more things. So um, I think overall, the thing to take away from everything I learned is really Student engagement and belonging. That's what it comes down to. Student engagement and belonging. Students benefit when they're engaged, when they feel like they're being heard and engaged and their well-being, which includes mental health and you know, their spiritual health and all those other things, um, um, basic needs. It's another one, you know, food insecurity. These are all factors that play into it. When those things are being met, you know, we're, they're better students. And we have to meet them where they are, whether that's TikTok or you know, social media and branding reaching out, you know, surveys that are shorter. We just have to figure out ways to reach the students and meet them where they are and bring a holistic approach as well. And again, not just about mental health, but their overall well-being. Are they eating? You know, their housing. All these basic elements really contribute to the, the factors of plants of substance use and things of that sort. Really appreciate you sharing that perspective, Kristen. You talked about 
students are better off when they're engaged. We did our best to engage our students over the summer. And I've talked about it a little bit. I'm going to tell you that when we asked our youth substance use prevention program, we cast the net very broad and wide. We looked all over the country for the best, brightest and best of those students. We had a budget for about eight to 10, and we wound up admitting a few more than that because we had some guys we just couldn't let them go. You remember that, Conrad? We just couldn't let them go. We had a brother that you won't get to meet tonight, but from as far away as Chicago, who joined us for four hours a week. And, you know, young people, young people, old people, it doesn't matter your age. You got a lot going on in the summer. So we were all really impressed that they were so committed and so engaged and ready to get down to work. I've talked enough about that. Let me introduce you to three of them, because I kind of feel like the three of us maybe are taking a little credit. We're not trying to, but we're taking credit for the incredible work that they did. First up, Joel Swazo. Brother Joel, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. Glad I could make it. Really glad to have you. Hang tight. I got some questions for you in a minute. Next up, Eric Gonzalez. What's up, Eric? How y'all doing? That was that was an amazing presentation, Coach Crump, and I think I'm doing good, really good. Coach Crump always knocks it out of the park, don't he? I I can continue with this coach analogy. Yeah, Coach, you you tore that up. I have to say that was really really impressive. Good to Thank see you, you, Eric. And Michael Betlack, he's the third of our students for tonight. Not about half of the cohort we wound up with, maybe a third of them. What's up, Michael? What's up, Michael? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Really fantastic. Good to see you, Michael. These other two guys, Joel and Eric, we actually had a Brother Be Well production the other night. So I've seen them now once since August 11th. I'm not seeing you at all since then, Michael. So I know you're back in school right now. appreciate you taking time to be with us tonight. Let me start out with you. You took a look at that presentation of Coach Crump's. What, what stood out for you that was a reminder of the incredible work, half of the incredible work that you guys did with regard to policy? What stood out for you? Any one particular thing you want to talk about before I throw out a few direct questions? Yeah, I feel like um, the thing that stood out to me the most was just how much work we actually did, like how many actual school districts, too, that we went over in such a short period of time. And one of the things that, you know, kind of got uh, I got reminded of with Coach Crump's presentation right now was uh, one of my concerns was like, how do these students find out about these resources that they have? And so the communication between the schools and the students was big when I was you know, on my end, when I was looking at these different policies and just resources that they have, because I feel like, you know, it's good to have it. Of course it is. But if the students don't know about it, then like, what good is it really doing? And so that's something that, you know, I was kind of reminded of right now. Really appreciate you sharing that, Michael. And we'll get back to you in a few minutes. Y'all are getting a feel for what a Brother Be Well production. Like Michael just found out he's, he's in school at Sac State and he's going to have to jump out the dorm he's in. I understand you got a fire alarm coming up, Michael. Yeah, I just got a text from my roommate literally two minutes ago saying that there's about to be a fire alarm, so I might have to be uh, jump out for like 10 minutes. Sorry about that. No worries. Jump out, jump back in as you can. We know how to bob and weave, don't we, Kristen and, and Kyrie? We know how to make it work. I remember one production, I, my connection failed, and I came back thinking the whole thing is shut down. Coach Crump was in there hosting the whole deal. It took care of it, so we'll be all right, Michael. Good to see you. How about you, Eric? What have you got to, what was a reminder for you? What stood out when Coach Crum walked us through that, that half of that PowerPoint deck? Well, like when I was, um, when he was giving it out and when I was like, I was just like kind of reading it along it reminded me of like the multiple nuances we kind of went around when we were exploring these and giving our recommendations of this is that we kind of dove a little bit deeper into it because we knew that we were giving suggestions and everything, but then they kind of broke it down by saying, oh, well, there's other factors that play into it, like budget, you know? Not every school is made. Every school, you know, is made differently. Every school has a certain amount of students, has a certain amount of schools, and and as uh, Coach Crum mentioned, they're stretched really thin. So that's like a factor we all considered in. And along with that, is we also, um, I think another big thing is like like Michael mentions that we always mention at least like once or twice that how are they giving these resources out to the students, and are they at least you know advertising these to the students? Because if they're not, then they're pretty much just sitting there collecting dust. Those are some really good points, Eric. And, and um, Kristen, as you were wrapping up, you even mentioned reaching students where they're at. And you mentioned TikTok. TikTok, none of that social media was even around when I was in high school. So that's one of the reasons we really wanted to engage young people and find out exactly where they're at, what are they about, how, how are they getting information, what's the best way to do that. And we could conceptualize that, try to figure it out, but the best way is to ask our youth themselves. So really appreciate those points, Eric. 
Joe, what about you? What stood out for you as as Conrad was walking us through half of the work that we did last summer? Well, for the work we did, um, it was actually a lot and it was very unexpected. So uh, for the most part, it was very interesting to see how, you know, certain schools have certain things, certain other schools didn't have certain things. Like um, one of the schools that was mentioned was um, Folsom, I believe, and it was mainly focused on tobacco when, you know, fentanyl and other drugs and alcohol is playing a big part in society now, not just tobacco, as you would see. So, you know, for us to actually look at it and provide our own perspective on how, you know, we um, went through those situations in high school, middle school, um, elementary, um, we were able to provide our own experience and overall just, you know, try to improve for the youth who are in these schools and, um, you know, are um, coming in contact with these situations. So I thought it was a great experience and uh, thank you, Conrad, for the great presentation. Thank you, brother. You you remind me, Joel, that you mentioned again that it was unexpected for you guys. We decided to get it relatively late, but we weren't sure how that was going to work. Everyone was really impressed with the depth of thought that you guys gave to those policy recommendations. Let's look at let's look at and think about it. Christian, I'm gonna wrap up with you here to see if the guys kind of are on track with what, what you're thinking with regard to it, what might be the priority. But I want to ask now, Joel, first maybe. So you just had Mike. What, from your perspective, is the top uh, substance use prevention and then the top mental health issue that these schools need to really be thinking about? What I, I, I don't want to speak for Roland. I think I know what Roland Williams, our master addictions counselor, might say on the substance use side. Chris, I have no idea what you might say on mental health. So I can't wait till we get at this. But Joe, what do you think is the number one mental health issue that young people in schools need to, are dealing with and student and staff need to focus on? And then what's the number one substance use prevention issue? Um, I would say for that is um, the mental, the main mental health thing that they should focus on is providing um, resources for these youth that are very attainable and accessible. Um, to where, you know, they see posters, flyers, they have people that are coming in contact with these classrooms and providing their expertise on how to navigate through these situations or questions they might have um, about substances and also, you know, um, how to go through their like mental health difficulties in case they're having, um, you know, troubles at home or, you know, don't know how to become socially with other people or other youth in classrooms. Um, so, yeah. Appreciate that. And and you mentioned trouble at home. So, Christian, I am going to ask you a question. What can you talk a little bit about how schools and home need to work together to make all of this work? So I would think in even the best possible world with regard to schools, they can have a very robust, well-funded mental health and substance use prevention program. But if there's not support in the home, that those efforts might not be as effective. Am I am I right about that? Yes, more are you accurate on that? Uh, and that's really connected to that communication is connected to the health promotion programs at these schools. Um, hopefully should add health promotion program will you know develop some of these connections, the linkage between all and in and school. And when looking at that, uh, of course, that takes money. <laughs> you know, uh, so these programs can't run without money. And there are several, uh, and so I think my, my next point is really well, having the, the funds and understanding and knowing um, where these funds are coming from to be able to support these programs, such as, you know, right now there's the behavioral health, um, such as these uh, programs going on to the state. There's a lot of funding through the uh, California Behavioral Health Initiative that provides funding for these type of programs. Uh, where they're giving out billions of dollars to support these programs. And the MHSA, the Mental Health Services Act, is now being changed, the Behavioral Health Services Act, to include uh, homelessness and housing and substance use. So there's a lot of things that um, uh, out there right now that can help fund some of these programs that we we're talking about when it comes to um, home programs and to that communication between house and school because money is the main issue. Yeah, yeah, it often is. And especially in those districts where money is kind of tight anyway, I would imagine it's even more of an issue in those smaller districts. 
Eric, what about you? What's the number one uh, mental health issue that you think young people in these schools need to be thinking about on the substance use prevention side? In, you know, it's it's really like difficult to pinpoint one, I'd say, because in school, a lot of things are happening, you know, the different things are changing. And I'm not sure if this counts as kind of like a mental health issue, but more like a, a thing, but it's giving teachers the tools and the knowledge in order to de- help kids going through a mental health crisis. So I don't know if that's exactly it, but I feel as though like, and I've said it once I said before, but like educating the teachers who you give your kid off to, because you know, you go from school to all the way to kindergarten to all the way to your senior and even even more when you want to go to college and all that. So you're spending most of your life in school. So wouldn't you want the person that you're giving your kid off to that spends most of the day that most of the day with to know how to handle your child for when they're, you know, eventually, you know, they, they break or something's gotten the better at them and they're, they're not feeling the best that day to help them get through it slowly and slowly and slowly and then point them in the right direction of the help, of the help that they may need. Well, while, while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to throw that same two questions to you, Conrad, but, but Eric, you just reminded me of something else. And Joe, I want you to answer this question too, but you first, Eric. Can you describe really briefly the, the public school, the high school system that you came from here? Because I, I think what I want people to get is there are going to be a lot of people watching this. Some are from those very big districts, those well-funded districts. Some are from smaller ones. Some are rural. Some are more urban. So can you just describe the high school or the district that you attend? And then, Joe, I'll ask you to do the same. You know, when it, uh, when it came to like the high school I went to, um, I think, you know, like every person who graduates from high school and then they go visit to go say hi to a teacher, um, you'll notice that they're doing a whole lot of renovating and you'll ask like, oh, why wasn't that there when I was there? So, you know, that's something that I went through. But when I was there, it was, um, I'd say it had a decent amount of funding. Of course, there were resources there in which like, you know, not student, not every student took advantage of. And probably due to the fact that it wasn't well, you know, advertised, of course, but, you know, I've seen some of it, um, of the things they did, because I worked closely with the teacher who advertised for it. So I did my best to, to do it as well. So that's sort of like the ground I came from. It was, it was nice though. My high school was, it was, it was nice. Appreciate it. How about you, Joel? Where did you go to high school? What, what was that school like with regard to resources? So um, for me in high school and middle school and elementary, I actually didn't really see too much of mental health services or um, substance abuse services. Um, Me, when I went to high school and middle school, I was actually placed in the foster care system. And luckily, me being in the foster care system, they had um, resources here and there where I was able to meet with therapists um, and able to, you know, um, communicate with them um, how stuff was going. And I felt like back then fentanyl and, you know, all these other drugs or opioids or pills and stuff like that wasn't really around. But now it's starting to be a thing, starting to be a trend, you know, with um, celebrities and influencers or just, you know, uh, rappers who make music and stuff. It's kind of the thing now. So I feel like a lot of the technology and Internet um, people kids primarily you know are intrigued in that and they want to experiment especially when you're you're younger you want to get into that so um hopefully now at my schools they are you know um taking into account what we are saying or you know seeing these type of videos um so they can add those services there at you know those schools for those youth yeah yeah i really appreciate it joel i i I have the same hope Conrad, tell us a little bit, Coach Crump, tell us a little bit about that original question. What do you think the top uh, <clears throat> prevention issue was top of mind or should be top of mind for a lot of you? What's the big one they're dealing with? And then on the mental health side, what do you think is the big one? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. I'll start backwards. Um, I think with the mental health piece, kind of alluding to what uh, Christian was was mentioning, it's funding. Um, you know, being able to have funding, which can provide training for teachers, staff, individuals who might be able to identify some of those mental health challenges and not just write it off as a a behavioral problem, um, whereas a student might actually really be going through something. So having the ability to train folks so that that way they can identify issues and at least know the difference between um, when a person is really truly going through something I think is is key. Um, I would say that would be probably number one. 
as it relates to the substance use disorder, I personally feel like it really varies across cultures, um, you know, ethnicities, um, age groups, um, geographical regions. Um, you know, as we know, as we all know, alcohol is, is kind of like a, you know, more acceptable substance within our society. But as we've recently seen in California, we've got folks who are now, you know, smoking cannabis or smoking weed more often because it has been, quote unquote, legalized. Um, I would say vaping is a huge issue, especially with our young folks, um, you know, tobacco, vaping, all of those different things. So it can really vary, um, you know, across, you know, spectrums of when you're talking about what, um, you know, would be the biggest issue. But ultimately, I think, you know, what is cool at the time when it comes to young folks. Um, I know that lean was a big thing in certain communities. So the codeine and promethazine, the double cup, and like not really understanding you're drinking a type of opiate and what that does to you in the long term. But because it's cool, you know, it's something that folks, you know, young folks are doing. Um, so it, like I said, it can vary. But ultimately, I think education being able to share and, and help young folks understand what this truly does to you and the effects that it can have on you is something that is really key in really driving the message home of maybe I don't want to engage in that or maybe I want to think twice before I, you know, go hang out with this person because that's what they want me to do. So I think those would be the, the key pieces. Really appreciate that, Kyra. Kristen, I, I'd like you to lead us a little bit um on on the clinical end of this question. I, I'm wondering about, you reminded me, Conrad, of a lot of the work that we did last summer and learning for me that a youth, a young brain isn't fully developed for our men until they're in the mid to late 20s. So that really heightened the urgency for me. Then when I'm listening to 13, 14, 15, 16 year old young men, try and let's really talk about fentanyl, cocaine and, and heroin, that's deep enough, cannabis. And it literally altering not just the chemistry of the brain, but influencing and, and impeding the development of it. They're, they're not winding up as a young adult with as much brain as, as they need to have. The layman talking, Christian, can you talk about there what that what what those issues are? We, we mentioned it at the beginning, but it's critically important that we get in there early enough to stop some of these behaviors so that they don't have an impact on mental health. And then can you also talk about your licensed marriage and family therapist? What's the top issue for mental health issue for young people from your perspective? Is it anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation? What's going on with our young? Well, that's a loaded question <laughs> uh, because the, it's, it's important to add. It's, and when you're looking at the, the bigger scheme of things is the brain. The one thing we understand in science now is that um, individuals is going to be, it's not going to be at 0% abstinence rate. So the, the model of abstinence, remember say no to drugs. Remember that that was yeah. an abstinence model. Uh, and studies show that sometimes it's been effective, but not in all areas, not all, in all communities. So now, um, a uh, harm reduction model is the next model that's being used where you're looking at harm reduction and you're looking at, uh, spaces and what does that come down to again, logging, allowing a student to come and say, Hey, I have a problem. Hey, um, I want to, yeah, I want to continue using, but I'm not ready yet. So now you're looking at the ambivalent state, get kind of clinical in terms of um, how you would treat it. But now you have to allow someone to come and bring their issue versus saying, no, don't use. We know scientifically, if you stop using cold turkey opiate, that can lead to serious, serious issue. If you're, uh, if you're drinking alcohol, if you're dependent on alcohol, that's even fatal. If you stop cold turkey. So just saying no, doesn't work. So that's the first thing is adopting a new model, but seeing a lot of current the, the ways that are rising vaping and, and uh, not understanding the impacts that it's having as your body. Because so the next step, I think is educating students and that faculty on how the physical is just as important as the mental. And when you, you know, break your arm, something happens to your arm and go to a doctor. When you have something you're dependent on or addicted to, you go see someone for help. So there's some cultural things in there as well. So I think cultural support and cultural competence is another area um, where I see um, students struggle with, because you're looking at stigma and, and with the Native American community, there's a heavy disparate rate of alcoholism. So how do we treat that? So there's a lot of cultural competency things that 
um, ICE working with students and uh, our families normalize some of these conditions. That's all about education. So those are the few things that I'm seeing is you no know, belonging and what model are we using to treat substance use with you? Such a such an important set of issues, Kristen. I really, really appreciate it. Before I, I pose a, uh, a closing question for you guys, I'm gonna let everybody give closing thoughts about today. And again, this is part one of a two-part presentation. So we're gonna come back together and Conrad's gonna walk us through the ballots of those districts that we took a look at last summer. But Michael, I wanna ask you just two quick questions. Can you talk about the high school you're from with regard to resources? What resources were there on the substance abuse side or the mental health side or both in the high school you're from? I just wanna give everybody a, a flavor for the breadth of students. You guys came from all over the place, different districts, different experiences. So could you talk about that a little bit? And then tell us from your perspective, what, what's the number one? I remember, I believe it was last summer, we had someone in the Institute who told us he started out ready to try heroin when he got back to college. And he wound up by the end of the summer and he said, you know what, I've, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to do this. And we always say when we do this kind of work, if we can reach one person, then it was a success. I, I got to feel what that was like to hear this young man say he was waiting for the summer to end and he was going to party and check out heroin. And he said, after those 10 weeks, I'm not going to do it. So Michael, I want to hear from you. What, what's your, what are your thoughts about the number one issues on the substance use side? and the mental health side that young people are dealing with. But also tell us about your, your school, your high school. Yeah, so I went to a high school in um, Fresno, California. It was called Bullard High School. Um, and I feel like the only real resource we had was we had like an on-site therapist, but it was only one person. And so, you know, it'd get pretty packed pretty soon. Um, and so I feel like we really didn't have much resources there. And there is a big, a big problem with um, THC and um wax pens during my time of high school like I couldn't go to the bathroom you know without either smelling it or knowing that someone's in there you know just smoking on a wax pen and so it was real it was real um involved in the school and it was just a lot of people who were doing it you know got to a point to where security guard they would just you know they it would be part of their patrol to go into the bathroom and make sure that nobody's doing it and so that's kind of a little bit of context of the school that I came from and kind of the issues that, that we face there. Um, I feel like with that high school, you know, a bunch of the recommendations that we gave to the ones here in Sacramento could also, you know, apply to them because we, I don't know anything else that we have besides um, that one therapist. And I feel like regarding the biggest problems with youth and substance and, and mental health, I feel like, you know, obviously like Christian said, you know, fentanyl is a big, huge thing right now. Um, because of Brother BY, actually, I enrolled in another class here at my at my college about drugs and, and human behavior. So, you know, I'm getting a continued education on it and just learning about, you know, how crazy these these drugs can just drastically change your life and learning about different things from like stimulants, you know, to opioids to hallucinogens. And so I've just had a continual continuation on my learning and I feel like the biggest thing that I finding out about is opioids and all. And, you know, like Christian said, it's just, it happens on accident, you know, sometimes with these, with the kids, because it's just getting put in so much stuff and, you know, we really don't even know it. And so like, that's definitely, you know, the biggest thing that we're facing right now with substance abuse. Do you remember, Michael, I don't want to belabor this, but do you remember the part of the summer where Roland talked to us about fentanyl? Roland Way was our master addictions counselor. And when he talked about young people and old people, you know, you go out and you think you're buying uh, some, some, for lack of a better term, some good heroin or some good coke, and it's laced with fentanyl, and you don't even know it, first of all. So you think you're, you, you probably understand that that's, whatever you're doing is not in your long-term best interest with regard to your physical health. But certainly you don't even know that what you're doing is laced with fentanyl. And then when you when the family finds out, it's often because the person doing it has has died. That was really a powerful moment for me. And I see Conrad, you're nodding, and Conrad has some personal experience with it. I don't want to call you out, Conrad, but would you agree with me there? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I have friends um who have personally who have died um due to fentanyl poisoning. I don't call it overdose. Um it's an actual poisoning. Um, because they're unsuspectedly know, uh, not knowing that they're taking something that they did not intend on taking. Um, and yeah, it just hits home. You know, even my own story. I mean, I'm 
over three years, you know, clean and sober now from drugs and alcohol. And, you know, I remember back there would be times where I would question, does this have fentanyl in it? You know, or like I, I'd have to think like, you know, and, and it just got to a point. I even remember a time where someone was with me and they were like, well, you do some first because I don't know if it's got some fentanyl in it or not, because they had had someone who passed away. So it's just it's such a huge issue right now because it can be in any and everything. So, yeah, really appreciate it, comrade. While you got the floor, let's just get closing thoughts. Just one or two minutes. What what are closing thoughts on today? I know you're going to be back with us to talk about round two and the new districts. Any closing thoughts on our conversation today? Then I'm gonna kick it to our youth, and Conrad. I'm a Christian rather. I'm gonna ask you to wrap it up. For us. Yeah, I w- I would just say you know you don't know what you don't know. Um, and for young folks, or whether that's school administrators, whether that's districts, you know, um, take the time to really find out and investigate, um, understand thoroughly as much po- as much information as you possibly can about whether it's mental health challenges or whether it's substance use disorder, whatever that thing is. And I guarantee you, the more you know, the more you can help someone and the more you can actually be able to better understand those who are struggling and those who are in need. Really appreciate it, Conrad. Uh, I'm going to kick it to our youth, and I'll first start out with Joel. You guys, this may be the first. I don't know if it is or not, but it may be one of the only opportunities you have to talk to school administrators who have uh, the agency to make changes in their district, so about about substance use prevention or about mental health or both. So, Joel, what are your closing thoughts on this conversation to those folks? Um, some of my closing thoughts are is, you know, this is a great presentation. Everybody's insight and experiences you know, um, amazing here. And I would say for, uh, for the administrators and stuff, you know, be, be welcoming to the youth, um, take them with open arms. Some, some people have mental issues and they use substances to cope through these, you know, difficult times or, um, hardships with their family members, or, you know, just even wanting to be accepted around the peers that they are or their family is, you know, indulging in these substances or they have um, these problems. Um, And, you know, one may never know until they actually come forward and explain that to someone. But you also have to provide that acceptance and provide that open ear and that open heart um, so they can be able to do that and also just point them in the right direction of resources and, you know, just being there for them. So, I love that, Joel. Open ear and open heart. I'm going to carry that one with me tonight. We all need to carry it with us. How about you, Eric? Tell us about, give us a minute or two. You're talking right to those school administrators and staff. What do you want to say to them? Man, I, I, re, I to, for like a message, I think I'd say something along the lines of, I'd say what Christian Jacob said when he began it. Um, there's no such thing as a, um, as a gateway drug anymore. And I feel like they should really take that to heart. And really sit on it a little bit to the point where, you know, you never know what could happen to any of your students. And again, like Joel said, embrace them with open arms and make the students feel like this is somewhere where they want to be and they want to learn. They want to get an education and they want to further it out. And, you know, just to support them and and as much as you can, really. And I know there are like limitations in what you can do, but just try to do the best you can and try to do the most you can because, you are in a position of power to do so. So it is your right to do so and to spread and to kind of help those kids, you know, get on the right path. Y'all are doing it all over again. I remember that summer. Now that we went by, one of you young men did say something. And I just went, wow, I wasn't that smart when I was that old. How did y'all come up with that? It, it's within your purview. So you have to do it. You have a responsibility. I love it, Eric. Michael, what about you, young man? What have you got to say to these school administrators? Uh, I'll say something kind of along the lines of Eric, like, I just want, you know, all of you to take initiative on this because, you know, that's what the education system is for. It's to educate the youth. Um, You know, I feel like there's no better way to tackle this problem than to educate people about, you know, what the drugs can do to you, how they can ruin your life, you know, just how easily you can become addicted to them. Um, Like we've seen, you know, what policing drugs has done hasn't changed anything and so i feel like if we if you know the schools take initiative on just educating and educating and educating at least the people will know you know the true extent of what they're doing with their decisions to to get involved with drugs 
Education is what those schools are all about. I love it too, Michael. Really appreciate it. Michael Betlack, Eric Gonzalez, and Joe Suazo. Y'all got to see. Those of you watching now, this is this is a part of that cohort for the summer. When I say Conrad's nodding and Chris is nodding, we say that was a dynamic group of young people. We're get, just getting a slice of it right now. They did some amazing work over the summer. Proud of all of them. Before we get out of here, Kristen, bring us all the way on here. What would you have to say? A licensed marriage and family therapist. You've taken a look at those seven or eight districts. Conrad, I forget. How many did we look at just now? Seven today. We did seven today. Part two, we're going to look at the balance. Kristen, you're talking directly to people at those districts. What would you have to say as we get ready to say, hang on, not quite goodbye, farewell to part two. What would you have to say to, as we wrap up this part one? I would say to the administrator, just see yourself as you're passing the torch, you're passing the torch. You're, you're, the students you're working with now are eventually going to go to a two-year or a trade school, or hopefully, you know, be a, a product of the community you're working or a four-year in the university. So you're 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 cultivating uh, someone to go into the next setting, present and aware. And that's one thing I want to say. And just for the recommendation, I strongly encourage you know the administrators to really look at implementing. Um, to, to go explore into the health promotion programs where you can implement some of these programs to support naloxone and uh, fentanyl. Um, some of those programs look like um, installing a, a Narcan system in your school where you give out Narcan and you have a promotion program where everyone has, um, or the ball could be everyone gets one Narcan in their backpack or um, promoting test strips, drug test strips that you can use to test a, a drug where you test a liquid, a liquid to see if there's anything laced in it. So these are some of the programs I would really encourage in this funding state funding going on right now. Getting to the advocacy game right now, there's three bills going forward. It's for promoting um, the use of these um, um, polls in schools. So that's one thing I would say. And the next is just uh, encourage the board building and building a sense of belonging. Because you got all the programs in the world, but if you can't relate to those students, they won't use them, they won't come to you. And I'm sure we can all relate to that. And especially for cultural bias, and a lot of cultural uh, things that have hurt the community, especially communities of color, we really have to look and see how we can reach a cultural competency part of substance use, not just regular substance use treatment. Christian Jacobs, licensed marriage and family therapist and brotherly well clinical advisor. Coach Crump, Conrad Crump, mentor to these guys and a lot of other guys on that brotherly well platform. And then Michael Betlack, Eric Gonzalez, and Joe Swazo. Can I thank y'all enough for checking in for this part one? Y'all all be back with me for part two. Where we're going to take a look at some more districts. But I want to thank you right now for everything today. Thank you. And I want to thank you for checking out this video. Again, take a look at part two. Go to brotherbewell.com and you can find part two of this conversation where we take a look at another seven or so districts as a part of this school policy work. And while you're there, brotherbewell.com, you can sign up. We're a membership-supported service. Join us as a member right now at brotherbewell.com. Memberships are free, so take care of that. While you're there, give us your email address and sign up for our blog. And then the conversations just like this one are made live, and we've got a host of videos, audio podcasts, print pieces, all kinds of incredible resources to help you be well. You can be the first, among the first to know about that. So take care of all of that at brotherbewell.com. My name again, Michael P. Coleman, Content Director for Brother Be Well. It's an honor of mine to serve in that capacity for you. I'm going to ask you to do two things for me until I see you and talk to you again. Take great care of yourself and then take great care of somebody else. Till next time, bye-bye.